Awesome. All righty, everyone. Well, thank you for being here for our last event of Global Entrepreneurship Week 2020, powered by Western Health Advantage. We're really excited to have all of you here and in the space. Um, and thanks to everyone for who engaged uh, across the whole week and um, just what a great celebration of innovation and entrepreneurship. And I couldn't think of a, a better way to finish with this conversation with uh, Romaine Taylor. Um, he's going to be sharing his story his, about his entrepreneurial journey, as well as just his story as being a, a U.S. Navy veteran and an alumni made at Sac State. So we're really excited for this conversation that's taking place this evening. My name is Cameron Law, and I'm the interim executive director of the Carlson Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And I've been serving as the Sacramento organizer for Global Entrepreneurship Week. And I also just wanted to recognize some of our team that was here who's been um, with us along this journey. So we have Arlene Miranda. She's probably waving in the screen, um, but she's been uh, such a key partner in really mobilizing this week with me. Um, and just so appreciative of her support. And then also wanted to recognize uh, Christine Miller, who's uh, the vice provost. Um, and she's just been such a champion for uh, Global Entrepreneurship Week for all of us as well. So I wanted to make sure I recognized her. Um, so for those of you that don't know, the Carlson Center serves as a regional hub and platform for providing approachable and accessible entrepreneurial education, community, and support to enable startup founders and students from all backgrounds to explore and launch their businesses. Our mission is to make innovation and entrepreneurship pervasive throughout the greater Sacramento region. And we have this steadfast vision to really make this region a premier hub of innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, we look at our resources and programs along the entrepreneurial continuum and really try to help you no matter where you are in that journey to be able to provide resources and opportunities for you. So we've bucketed our programs into what we call discover, build and launch. And within our Discover program, we have Global Entrepreneurship Week, which we're here celebrating. And we really want to make those on-ramps and really create some opportunities for you to be inspired and build some connectivity and some community to help you take those ideas um, and ultimately mobilize them into businesses and really solve our real world problems. For those of you that don't know, Global Entrepreneurship Week is indeed global. So we're joining over 180 countries who are celebrating innovation and entrepreneurship around the world. And so we're just really excited to conclude this week of events with this wonderful conversation. Um, our key partner in putting on this event was the Veteran Success Center at Sacramento State. And I wanted to recognize and give an opportunity for Mario Garza to to say a few words and um, tell us some of the resources that the Veteran Success Center has. So thank you for that, Cameron. Uh, as Cameron mentioned, my name is Mario Garza. I am the school certified official uh, here at Sac State. So um, the, uh, the mission of the Veteran Success Center is to provide a welcoming area where veterans and military connected family members can get the assistance they need in accessing, in accessing their VA education benefits, as well as access campus resources and help you transition into their career. I don't know if anybody noticed that I was actually reading that. Um, <laughs> but that is our mission and we stand by it. Um, the main focus uh, for the Veteran Success Center obviously is to process VA benefits for our students. But the other part of that uh, mission is to actually support our veterans in any way that we can, academically, uh, financially, an emotional support, whatever we can uh, for our students, that's why we're there. So partnering with Cameron and the Carlson Center is just another facet of that. We have a lot of uh, veterans on our campus uh, who are interested in developing their own businesses, becoming their own, uh, becoming owners of, of, of businesses that, they, uh, that they're proud of. And so we're very happy to partner with the Carlson Center uh, and as uh, Cameron mentioned, Romaine uh, is a veteran of Sac State, so he's been around our office and he knows it well. And so we're very proud of the fact that uh, Romaine has been su as successful as he has. So uh, with that, I'm going to give it right back to you, Cameron. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Mario, and thank you for the partnership. Um, we look forward to, to partnering further, and I know there's um, some great future of, of ways we can collaborate and better serve um, our veterans on campus as well as in the community. So I look forward to, to working with you. And so now let's uh, jump into the main part of it. I know you're probably tired of hearing both the uh, Carlson Center and the veteran pitch. So let's um, hop on into um, hear Romaine's story. So I wanted to do um, an introduction, then I'll turn it over to him to, to share his story. So Romaine is a Jamaican immigrant who came to the United States in the mid 90s. Um, he's a US Navy veteran who served from 2005 to 2013. 
He's also a Sacramento State School of Business alumni with the concentrations in management, marketing, international business, and entrepreneurship. And he also is the founder and CEO of Easy Vibe. Uh, the business was founded in 2017 and started out primarily as a catering business that then has transitioned to manufacturing and bottling Jamaican cold brew. His hobbies are working out, yoga, sports, and playing with his Doberman Pinscher pups um, or pup and mentoring others. And so we're just really honored to, to have him here and just wanted to say thank you for your service and also for being uh, a risk taker and starting your venture um, and creating some amazing resources in terms of cold brew and some amazing meals for our community. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Romaine Taylor. He'll tell us a bit about his story and then we'll jump into some Q&A at the end. So take us away. All right, thanks, Kevin. Thanks everybody for tuning in. So my entrepreneurship journey started not in, not directly, but indirectly. I noticed that I had a certain different drive when it came to like the dream mile that we ran in middle school. And I realized that I was always faster than my cousin. That's the competitive nature of me. So Throughout the last lap of that race, I looked to my right and actually saw my cousin. And I said, um, I don't know where I'm at in this pack of fields, but I used to beat this guy. So that gave me the extra motivation to kick that gear up. And it turns out that he came in 15th place at the end of the race and I came in third. So that means I was in the middle of the pack, which I was not happy with. And so that's where I jumped right up into the top three. So that was indirectly. Now, when I got to high school, I was actually selling candy. Not for any school's club or anything like that, because I realized that they were selling the regular size candies for a dollar. So if I used to go to Walmart and I noticed the king size is 60 cents, I know I could sell it for a dollar and make a return. So this is how good I knew I was getting when I was doing this. The school actually sent out a memo to the teachers to say anybody who's not in the club cannot sell candy. And I think that was primarily on the operation that I was doing. So I had to stop selling candy while in high school. Um, fast forward to while I was at Sac State, I used to go to Jamaica all the time. It's, it's home for me. So when I used to go back for spring break, early 20s, I used to party a lot. People see the pictures, they see the videos, they want to do that. So I'm good at reading the room. And this is a great trait that every entrepreneurship should have is how you read a room. If you get a good sample of what people are interested in what you're doing, you should probably take a leap and go after it. So I just started a little tour company that took college students to Jamaica because I have family connections still there, friends that were taxi drivers that will make sure everybody has a good time and it's very inexpensive because I do get residence rates as far as hotel and entries because I'm a dual citizen. So I just use what to my advantage to give people the same experience that I have. Uh, my last year at Sac State was 2015, the spring. I started to problem solve a lot more. So I used to walk around and say, what can I fix better? So my last uh, spring of 2015, I had gotten a patent done on a um, self-sustained trash can that will hold the bag from falling back into the cylinder. So that was exposed to a few trade shows in Las Vegas. Um, I couldn't really lock down a manufacturing to really get that scaled out. So I still have a patent. If I want to jump back on it, I can, but I kind of left that where it was. Fast forward, I jumped into real estate investing it turns out within two months after learning real estate investing, I got a off-market deal under contract. Now, I never know what kind of success I'm having until a mentor or somebody who's been doing this a long time stops me and says, I'm going to be honest with you. When you came to me two months ago, you're getting into real estate investing. You're going to be getting these off-market deals. I hear this all the time. And for you to get it in two months, he's uh, that's very impressive because People don't get off-market deals on the contract within that time frame. I didn't even do that. So he said, whatever you're doing was working. Fast forward from real estate investing. I'm working out at the gym. So I decided to go vegan August 2017. And I was still maintaining a muscle mass because I stopped eating meat the next day. It was cold turkey. So being a cook that I am, I had to come up with recipes 
on the fly and it was working. People at the gym says, no way, you can't be that physical without eating meat. So I just educated them more about diet and what I provide. So if one person says, can you make me some meal prep throughout the week? Okay. Then it starts to go into one, two, three. Once I get about 10 people, that's a good sample size. So I said, I should probably turn this into a business. Um, within three months, December, I wasn't operating. I was still getting the funding up as far as the paperwork. I got a email from SMUD. They said, would you like to be a caterer for SMUD with a two-year contract of 82000 for each year, total of 164 I said, I don't do catering. I was just doing meal prep. But I never replied to say I can't do something. That's something I will never do. I'll figure it out. So January came around. I said, yeah, I will let to do that. And between January and April, I think I was getting average on four hours of sleep because I was still working a full-time job and they had a lot of requirements for me to meet until I could get that contract. So once I got that contract, I seen a lot of avenues open. So once I was able to get that contract, I looked back and said, how was this contract able to be secured? I, legit, I legitimized the business to the point where People who have to reach out to do contact with you because one, when there's a lack of culture in a community, people are more willing to try cultural experience because of what it's it's what makes the world goes around and what makes us understand each other better. And I registered my business as a vet owned business and a small business. So one thing I want every vet to know that's interested in starting a business is there's a criteria that most programs that's funded that gives seed fundings to businesses to fund small businesses. There is a small percentage of vet owned business that that funds has to be allocated to. So that should be more motivation for a vet to go pursue if they have a passionate drive to go pursue that because there's plenty of avenues open for that. Um, COVID came around this year kind of shut down SMUD. They're not in office until 2021. So I landed at Blue Diamond around the time the pandemic came. So I was still able to bring in a level of revenue, but the food was at a standstill. So I knew what I was working on last year was trying to innovate how I could bring coffee to the business. I'm sorry, bring coffee to the business because I did a catering for Smud last year, and I said, you know what? I'm going to hook him up with Jamaican coffee this morning. So I hooked him up with uh, some of the medium roasts. And Connie called me. She's a Smud employee. She's the one that booked that book in. She said, Romain, you didn't make enough coffee. I said, Connie, not made enough coffee. She said, no, you didn't. I said, okay, I'm going to be in the cleanup. So I want to go pick up the urn. One urn was empty. I went to pick up the other urn. That urn was still filled. I said, Connie, what happened? He said, well, whatever you brought over here, they kind of just dove in on that. So the, the bell started going off because I was like, I that, that's store-bought. That's on the shelf. So I said, if there is a store-bought stuff that nobody's buying or interested in getting them, I could probably get this type of product on the shelf. So I've been doing a lot of um, R&D for three months to figure out why there's not really Blue Mountain coffee beans accessible to us in the U.S., it turns out that Japan, China, Taiwan, and Koreans, uh, they import 80% of the Blue Mountains. So that leaves uh, 20% for the rest of the free world. So it's a low quantity, high price point. And most of these big uh, coffee chain industries, they tend to get their coffee at around $1.60 a pound. And they source it primarily from Colombia. So at that point, they're selling you a brand more than premium product because it doesn't fit their business model. I am by no means a big coffee conglomerate. So I said, any price point will work for me as long as I get this premium stuff out there that could represent my culture and my business at the same time. So when I came up with the cold brew beverage, I started sampling it to people and they said it was great. So me working at Blue Diamond a lot of the employees were wanting to buy the beverage off me. So I said, you know what? 
I think I need to go ahead and just start locking in on this. So I went back to my usual four to five hours of sleep while I really crunched this whole manufacturing process down because working at Blue Diamond had shown me like when I was doing the catering business, a pandemic came and it kind of took away a lot of the small food business operations. But manufacturing was still up because it was deemed an essential because they're stocking the shelves at these stores. So I said, if I'm bottling coffee in a pandemic, uh, I could wholesale to grocery stores and I'll still have a level of business still coming in, not primarily food. So I said, this is kind of recession proof. If not, it will still bring in more income. But my primary objectives was when I started the business. So as of Tuesday this week, um, me and Blue Diamond is in business now because they now want to supply the coffee beans in their coffee machines. And that means Starbucks coffee beans have to take a little side. I had to bump them to the side to fill the machines. So I am about March 2021 away from that fully being executed. That is pretty much my story right there. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing the story and sharing about, you know, all the different ventures from selling candy to now uh, selling cold brew. So um, I, I love the story and just some of the kind of key things I was taking out was it just seems like you have this, uh, this knack for seeing opportunities, right? Everything mm -hmm. from selling the candy where it was like, okay, this is 60 cents and I can, everyone's buying it for a dollar. Um, although you, you got shut down by the, the system and the education uh, setting you down there um, or the school. Um, that was pretty funny. And then in terms of, you know, I think one additional key thing I wanted to put a point in was uh, registering as a vet owned business and mm -hmm. really looking at the, the different opportunities. I know there's the funding component that you mentioned in terms of, you know, investors that, you know, maybe have that specific investment vehicle. But I also do know um, in terms of contracts, um, certain, you know, suppliers have a, um, a certain percentage that they have in terms of um, working with vet owned businesses as well. So thanks for, for highlighting that. Um, so I'll kind of kick off our Q and a with just a couple questions. Um, so I, I want to kind of take us back to when you decided to, to launch easy uh, vibe meals. And um, it seems like you have this knack for starting businesses, but would love to kind of get in your head and what were some of those factors you were weighing and starting and where did you look for support and resources? What I look for support well, I looked at support for myself because um, I will never force my dreams upon nobody to fulfill them because they were my vision and not theirs. So I have to see it to the forefront and I have to, you know, build a level of, hey, he's actually pulling in some kind of attraction. So that means I could invite more people on because if they can't fully see the vision, I could talk about it until I'm black and blue. But when it's being executed, people could see the full visual. Awesome. So like in, in terms of like, you know, jumping into, you know, building a supply chain distribution or anything like that, obviously you were ingrained in, you know, uh, either Blue Diamond or SMUD. Um, you know, how did you kind of gain that knowledge? Did you just experiment and learn or how did you kind of gain those resources to know how to, to navigate that whole industry? I had zero knowledge. I had zero knowledge. Of, well, I, I took a couple of supply chain courses at Sac State, but that was more academic learning. It wasn't OJT or translation quickly to operation when you're starting your own business. So when I jumped in to that supply chain, I said, okay, so I need to find suppliers. I need to find this. I need to find that. So once you jump into that, looking for suppliers, once you talk to one supplier, they're pretty much going to link you to the next supplier because their operation is not running solely on what they're selling you. If they're selling you dry ice, well, they have to have a container. So they'll let you know where to get the container. And if you're looking for packaging tape, bubble wrap, they could probably lead you to that same resources as well, because all those operations, what make their business go. So you talk to one business, you're going to get a lot more than what you came for, but you got to be sure to ask the questions because they won't know what you're thinking. 
Love that. Yeah. And I think it makes me think back to you being, you know, clear on your vision and being able to, to demonstrate to those suppliers what you actually need in, in terms of, you know, I guess if you're able to articulate strongly what you um, are trying to create, they can connect you to the right um, individuals as well. So um, thanks for that learning. So um, as, a, as a veteran, what are some of the unique skill sets and mindsets that you acquired, um, you know, maybe in your time of service that you think, you know, help serve you as an entrepreneur and kind of getting started? Well, growing up, I don't want to say I'm a shy kid. I was a selective with my voice. I only voice my opinions when I feel the need to. So for the most part, I think I was quiet, but not quite. Um, So I went in the military at 17. So when I got to boot camp, I didn't know what all I had. It it takes somebody to point it out to me because I'm just a young adolescent. So when somebody says, you should probably do this and do this because you're good. And I'm like, really? So when I start voicing my opinion, people's actually taking what I'm saying into consideration. I'm like, okay, I, I'm probably the youngest one here, but it seems like I found my voice in boot camp, and then it started to carry me out through my career. So now I'm a talker, and some people say I can't shut up now. So it un- unlock your voice, and and now you, yeah. know, now you can't stop talking. Now I love that, um, and appreciate you you sharing that with with all of us. So I have a kind of one one last question, and so if people wanted to start looking in the in the chat to throw some of their questions in, um, and we I'll start filtering those in to remain. Um, and this is kind of you know I I we're seeing the the growth of Easy Vibe me, uh, meals as well as the cold brew. Um, can you share with us some of the the challenges you might have faced in your different ventures and how you kind of um, you know either pivoted or you know overcame those and and you know kind of which led you to our success today? The hardest thing for anybody, and I this is what I preach. Um, success is how you want to visualize it. Some people want to scale things very high. Some people are very comfortable doing things part-time as a hobby. But I think if you want to turn a hobby into a profession to where it replaces your immediate profession, scaling is what you're going to have to do. And it gets, it starts to get a little lonely once you start doing this. Once you see how much potential you can get out of what you want to do, because those phone calls that you would be making to your friends or those texts that you're making to your friends to go out, those don't happen anymore because those phone calls are your suppliers and your business partners. So you will gain a lot more business relationships, associates, and you'll probably start to, your, your personal circle will decrease. So, so it sounds like your your suppliers and your customers become your friends, right? Oh, so big your time. your your circle of uh, friends definitely shifts. But um, that's a that's a great knowledge. Yeah, and I think you know one of the things we always you know kind of echo is you know entrepreneurship can be lonely, and um, you know finding those those resources of support is is always a key. So we got one one question in the chat. So feel free um, others that are on the call to to start throwing your questions in there. I'll I'll feed them in to remain. So it's considering you are a new in entrant to uh, the ready to drink coffee market. What's your challenges when dealing slash negotiating with suppliers of raw materials who like to deal with big brands? I don't know about dealing with big brand. I'm a small, I'm a small business. Um, it starts by, you just got to build a relationship with your suppliers. Um, it, it, they'll see by the volume, how well your business is going. And then you'll have more leverage to negotiate because everything is negotiation. Once you start doing business with your suppliers, starting off, um, for example, um, cause I was doing meal prep and I was looking to ship them all around like California. So when I was looking for a contract, uh, I met with a FedEx regional manager and he was just willing to give me, I don't know. I forgot the percentage. It was, it was really low, like maybe 30 percent on ground shipping and then i just shot an email to uh ups to, through their business um their, their business channel uh i worded it very diligently and it turns out that they no questions asked they just started my account up and i got 60 percent ground shipping off the back so A little bit of fluff, maybe, 
But I told him I was going to be shipping out 200 boxes a month. Did I ship out 200 boxes a month? No. But it's something I was going to work into. So they supplied the thermal print and print label machines. They supplied the rolls as well. The machine was $5 a month to rent. So I took that and I ran with it because it was more beneficial for me to do that shipping than to do it through FedEx. So I negotiated and I got the better deal. Unproven, by the way, that was unproven. So it's not not being afraid to to ask. It seems right. So going forward and using those. Yeah, that just pitch just pitch a solid plan. There you go. Um, so the a follow up from the same individual um, is how are you different between your Jamaican cold brew and other existing players? So how is it differentiated? So this cold brew, and this is a this is a number one question that people ask me before they taste it and then they find out the difference. The coffee beans that grow in the Blue Mountain, especially this uh, estate company I'm working with, the region that they harvest their beans from the mountains, it only gets about four to five hours of sunlight. And in the harsh conditions in the rainforest in Jamaica, the high elevations between 3,000 and 5,000 elevation, it takes on average six to eight months for coffee beans to fully mature. And in the rest of the world, the average is four to five months. So given those extra two to three months, the complex sugar in the beans take a lot longer to develop. So you got a bean that's more firm and has co more complex sugar. It's going to have a better distinguished taste and it's going to be naturally sweetened. And so when people say, is this really unsweetened? I said, it is unsweetened. It's just a complex sugar had a longer time to develop. And just for added bonus, the coffee beans grow in the tropical rainforest where there is mangoes, banana trees. So you're going to get fruit pollens as well. So I was like, it's, it's that good. Love it. Well, I love the, the science behind it and mm -hmm. um, yeah, learning more about that. So we got a couple questions in here. So how did the first year go about for, um, and, you know, launching easy vibe. So what were some of the challenges and then how did you manage to bring in customers um, when you were looking at the market? Challenges starting off. Hmm. It depends on which side, if it's the meal prep side, that side, was still climbing. If it was the catering side, because the business was operation on e-commerce, which was a meal prep, going out to the customers on UPS delivery, and the catering was based on SMUD, uh, the, the B2B contracts I had was SMUD, or Easy Cater, or Sac State Alumni Association, I did some there, or the Veterans Club at Sac State, they want me to do an event at the uh, Sacramento Food Bank. So I say that the, the B2B was the most successful. Anything that's going to be business to consumer is going to take a lot longer to develop because you have to put trust in the consumer because it's their money they're spending. So they want to have that experience. Awesome. Yeah. So I um, love that difference between the, the B2B and B2C. Mm -hmm. I, um, t it's interesting because it, you know, sometimes you'd think the B2B is the, the harder one because there's like this ecosystem to, to navigate, but it seems like you found the right, uh, you know, value proposition to those, um, those businesses and the corporation. So the next question is often entrepreneurs are dreamers, visionaries, creative types, but there's a big thread of hustle in your story accompanied by lack of sleep. I love that uh, add on. Um, what proportion of dreaming versus hustling do you think best serves someone trying to launch a business like yours? Well, I only hustle because deadlines were thrust upon me. If I knew I was going to go into a smud situation, if I knew their requirements were due not in three months, I would have a lot longer time to prepare. It's just when your back's against the wall, you're, you're going to execute if you really want it. Um, it doesn't have to be that grueling. If you write it down, the best thing to do is get organized. If you start writing things down, you don't have to let time get away because I tell people this, and I told somebody this yesterday. I said, D I said, don't let time work for you. Work for time. 
I like that. Awesome. Yeah. Well, um, thank you for, for sharing that. So our next question is how much of your business is web-based? How much of the business is web-based currently? hundred percent right now is the coffee hundred percent web-based. Uh, I will, since the launch was September 19th, officially to the community for the co-brew, I was doing public events. So I guess that was a small portion that I was doing in person, but given the COVID situations and weather climates and outdoor events, it is going to be now purely web-based for the Kobu beverages. Wonderful. And uh, we'll have to share your, your website in the uh, chat. So if you're able to, to share that so people could check out where, where to access that website and maybe put some orders of the, the cold brew in. Um, so our, our, while you're doing that, our next question is, how do you respond when consumer told you that they don't like the taste of the cold brew since they're saying, since basically since taste is subjective? So, you know, what are some of the... Um, I guess, not necessarily cons, but when you've heard other things like that, is there, you know, are you looking to change the recipe or is it pretty much just dialed in? Nope. I'm not looking to change the recipe because before I launched this, I did a sample sample test. It's it's private sampling because I don't like to make things really public because I was doing sample testing when I was done with my three months of R and D from uh, September to December. So I started doing taste testing, primarily on Sac State campus, since I go to the well a lot, and I was trying to show people that this is a healthier alternative to pre-workout. So I'm still preaching a health alternative to how I'm so energized in the gym besides what I eat. So I was doing the samples, and the samples is what's going to get you your uh, reviews. So out of probably 90 people, only one person said they wouldn't buy it. And they just said, I just, I'm just not a coffee drinker. So I took the one person that wouldn't want to buy it or didn't have a lack for it. And I said, well, that's, that's a good ratio for me. So even with the launch, uh, the public tastings, I had a few people that, you know, they don't like coffee and they admit they're not coffee drinkers as well. Or they really just have to put heavy creamer and sugar in it. And at that point, you're not drinking coffee. You're just drinking a uh, very well cold Oreo drink. <laughs> never, never heard it described like that. But I, I love that. Um, that's, that's hilarious. All right. So our, our next question is, um, so there's some context built. So there's a, a David and verse Goliath story arc to your experience from being a high school student working around, um, around school rules and then being shut down to being on the shelf next to Starbucks. Any advice for the, the Davids out there um, working to, to fight the Goliaths? Oh, I never bumped Starbucks off the shelf. No, that's not official. Next year it will be. And it's just in the Blue Diamond Corporation. It won't be nationwide because I don't think I will have that. I think it will be easier for the business to go deep than go national. Because when you go deep, you can control your supply chain a lot easier um, throughout the Western coast. When you start going national, then it starts to get a little tricky because I do believe I will lose quality of my product, given the fact that there is not that many you know, supplies out of the Blue Mountains for me to supply nationwide. So I would assume I would not be blending in other world coffee beans with my product or try to cheat the consumer because they'll probably taste the difference one. And I'm just not into that business. So the David and Goliath, um, just gotta stay positive. I just gotta stay positive. If you, if you have a plan written down, you could overtake anything. And I believe the internet has made it possible for any small business to go toe to toe with a big corporation because as big as Starbucks, big as Starbucks is, they advertise to the national market. I'm going I'm to I'm throw this out there. Starbucks has Blue Mountain coffee beans in, 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 in their cafes. Costco has Blue Mountain coffee beans. Is it the premium coffee beans? Probably not. 
I know Costco isn't because people have shared Snapchat, Instagram. They send me pictures like this is in Starbucks. I was like, well, I know for a fact that doesn't taste very well because it's grown below that 3000 feet elevation. So if it's closer to sea level, those will never taste great. So I said, this is premium. So uh, Costco's business model does not operate on wholesale and premium products. Right. Yeah. It seems like you've narrowed not only kind of you've, you've identified your market and, you know, been very deliberate about kind of the premium offering that you want to, to sell and um, staying yep. steadfast in that. And so I think that, um, you know, just for, you know, putting a pin in that, if, you know, being that kind of niche um, focus, you know, that allow you to capture a certain, um, you know, part of the market for sure. So thanks for sharing that. So our next question, I've recognized that in many entrepreneurs' stories, they have an element of luck slash pivotal moment in their beginnings. Was there one or more for you? Luck? I don't want to say it's lucky because it was just a business agreement. So when Smut sent that email, they were probably just searching a DGS database to look for a veterans food vendor to fill their cr criteria that they needed for their C funding. And I was a small business looking for business funding. So I guess it just worked out hand in hand. I wouldn't call it luck because I still did the groundwork to get the registrations complete and paying all those permit fees, which wasn't cheap. So if you, if you go about it the right way, it will pay off. So I don't think anything is going to be luck. If you execute, things are going to happen. Definitely. I want to um, have you dive deeper on kind of just what's that process like of going through the, you know, the veteran owned process. You kind of just mentioned there's the fees and, you know, so can you provide us some context of like what actually is entailed in that for um, our fellow vets in here? Um, DGS has all the information on their website. It is very helpful. They, they used to do pop-up shops to where you could go talk to, and Wayne Gross is the guru when it comes to DGS. He doesn't work with DGS no more, but he still works for them. He's, they still rely on him. I'm guessing as a consultant, I didn't ask him his official title, but me being smart enough to realize like he's probably a consultant that he's that, that good at what he does. Awesome. Thanks for that, um, that information. So you, you, uh, so the next question is you're an all round, all rounded entrepreneur, um, where you source and manufacture and sell, which process for you is the, is the toughest as you kind of have built your business. And maybe I'll add a question is, is it just you or, or do you have a team or, you know, who else is kind of involved in, in, in your business ventures? You used to have a team for the food because the food requires a lot of prep, cook and clean. And a lot of people don't like to clean, but I enjoy to clean because it gives me time to process my own thoughts. <laughs> um, when it comes to the coffee, this, believe it or not, it's, it's something I can do primarily myself. What I found the most challenging was I got to commercialize automatic label machines to label my bottles. Um, two ways I went about it since funds were tight. Any automatic label bottles made in the U.S., was running at least two grand or like 1700 to two grand on up. Alibaba had them for, I don't know, three to $400. Reading those reviews, two out of five stars, three out of five stars. Bad instructions, hard to put together. I watched some YouTube videos to put it together. So I made the executive decision to go that route to get my automatic label machine from China. Lord behold, all the instructions from the reviews that they said was absolutely right. It was no instruction whatsoever. I believe it was just a table of content for that <laughs> labeling machine. So I had to put my engineering hat on, which I'm not an engineer. So it took me eight hours, not in one day, eight hours throughout the course of two to three days to put that machine together. It comes with a laser, so it cuts off. The label has spacing in between. So when the space, it reads the spacing, the white space in between. So when it's, when it has numbers, it's on the label. When it's at zero, it's between. So I had to program that as well. And uh, 
This was eight hours of a lot of wine drinking, a lot of throwing bottles. I went through about 90 bottles with a lot of trial and errors. <laughs> but it turned out that I found the right calibration for the rolling pins for that laser. And it it started where it, everything was coming out very consistent. So I said, that was very tough, but it turns out it was the right investment because that left the business quite more funds to start investing into other supplies that's going to grow it. So, so as you look to, to scale the, the venture, where do you see yourself needing to hire someone? Like what would be your, um, what would be your first hire in terms of support? It's say say you close a deal with all the Safeways, um, and Albertsons where you had to like, you know, dramatically scale, what would be your first hire? Well, that's going too big. I like to start small and start with what I'm familiar with. Um, so I would say, well, I'm already familiarized with SMUD. So there will be buyers on catering basis. So they'll probably get larger volumes of these. Uh, Blue Diamond currently just wants the coffee beans. Eventually, we'll be working on getting the beverage in their gift shops. So these are small bases. The next one up will be drum roll, please. The grumpy mule on Sac State campus. Nice. Uh, I, I haven't talked to Nicole yet. I, I talked to Nicole all the time when it was coming to the food, when I wanted to get a food truck back in 2012, but I didn't like the idea. I only could come on campus once a month. So I didn't go that route. Um, haven't talked to her yet, but I kind of scope the the two commercial fridges that's in the Grumpy Mule when I was on campus. I said, um, okay, so we got about two rows of water bottles and not a lot going on in here. So let's say we just stock them up with these fabulous drinks. Well, I know I have, uh, I think I have a punch card ready to, to get some cold brew as well as a, a gift card, I think. Uh, I want to bet against Arlene, so she uh, she had to get <laughs> a gift card. But, um, it was only because I wasn't very smart and I didn't know what an ampersand was. So, <laughs> so it'll, yeah, it'll, it'll be it'll be small, Cameron. It'll it'll be small. I, I have to take baby steps. That's uh, all right, but that's a, I I mean, at the end of the day, right? I think you're um, what I'm pulling from it is you're super deliberate in your actions and your execution, which allows you to to maintain and make sure your operations are handling the uh, the scale at which you're working. So um, I love that. So we have a couple more questions coming in. Um, so we have, when developing your product, how did you figure out the packaging and shipping? The packaging. Now that far, oh, I'll, I'll touch on all packaging. So when it came to the label, I wanted to go with something that really resonate with coffee but really represented uh, Jamaica in itself. So the label is very well detailed with, I made sure the mountains were indeed blue. And if it's coffee, I said, we gotta give this an orange background. Um, everything that is designed from this business is things that I've drawn up. I am an artist, I, I can draw. It's kind of like a thing in the family, but I'm not a very good graphic designer. But if I could draw something very well and give it to the graphic designer, they just have to translate that digitally. So I wanted to make sure the package represented everything that was in Jamaica. Uh, somebody recommended, and I do take recommendations, opinions on everything. So when somebody suggested I remove the turquoise lining on the upper part, on all the borders on the label, I said, I don't think I could do that. Because that turquoise label represents the first thing you see before you even get anywhere in the Caribbean is going to be that turquoise water. So I have to put that somewhere on that bottle. I was going to say, I, I like that part. So yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you uh, made that executive decision mm -hmm. to, to keep it in there. All right. So we have a couple more coming in. So we have, can you share what activities you did when you first launched the product uh, to get awareness of people? Um, so how did you kind of start building that marketplace? Um, I just incorporate it into my day-to-day -day activity. If I'm going to the dog park, taking my dog to the dog park, I'm going to talk about my coffee. 
because people drink coffee at the dog park. If I'm going to the gym, I'm going to talk about the coffee. So you are your best brand. So wherever you go, you got to talk about it because that's going to be potentially your first customers. There you go. Mm -hmm. Nice. I love that. Um, are you, uh, so the next one is kind of the follow-up to that. Do you plan to sell your product uh, to grocery stores um, or are you planning to just kind of go um, straight to, to customers? No, grocery stores. That is the ultimate goal is to get them on the shelves. Nice. And what's kind of, what's your strategy you have around uh, approaching that marketplace? So the strategy is, so build it from, what I'm accustomed to, the relationships I already have developed with Sac State Smud, now Blue Diamond. Now we'll start to grow into co-op. Start to do co-ops, Davis, uh, Sacramento. Start locally and then start hitting the co-ops, those community stores that like to support the small businesses. Uh, then start to make a push for Whole Foods. Now I say make a push for Whole Foods. I believe Whole Foods should be the last on my agenda. Um, I don't think I could tie in Rayleigh's or Beller into my business model yet. Based on the fact that Whole Foods has a contract with Amazon. So if it does come to the point where they do want to not only buy the business out to where I do get royalties, um, they have the means and the logistics to get this further than what my business structure can get it. Nice. It's already a exit strategy in mind. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Everybody that starts a business, you got, you start a business to have an extra strategy. Totally. Yeah. Love it. All righty. So we have about 10 minutes left. We have one more question. Um, so you shared just now um, your marketing story for cold brew um, around pre-workout targeting the, the workout people. What other customer category are you targeting at them and what's the story to attract them? Coffee drinkers. So when you start doing partnerships with bakery shops, anything that has anything to do with breakfast, if you start doing breakfast pop-ups with, I don't know, if there's a food truck that does breakfast, you can start teaming up with them. If you know somebody that's doing farmer's market, you could team up with them since farmer's market's in the morning. You have to tie activities to where your consumer and customers are going to be. Because I never once did an evening activity for the cold brew. Although I do have customers that drink at 8 p.m., i.e. last night at the dog park. <laughs> they drank it right then and there. I was like, you must work from home. <laughs> I love it there. Um, so you identified your, your channels and we might be your, your evening cold brew people ready for, Hey, it's Friday night. And we, uh, we, we're going to tap into our, uh, our cold brew before the weekend. Um, I love that. Um, so I have, it looks like there's one one more question and, I, and I'll and i kind of, I guess, finish with one at the end. Um, so is there a difference in needs between B2B and customers and kind of, I guess, your B2C? And what are the, the I guess, maybe I'll articulate differently is what is the unique value proposition to, to each of them? Oh, the B2B. So, so the B2B, when it came to SMUD, was just two parties meeting the criteria and growing within that establishment because none of the employees at smut had easy five breakfast lunch dinner but when they had it it started to grow throughout smut so, and once the coffee started growing they knew the brand how it was when it comes to now growing outside of the b2b to b2c you want to make sure when you get to your consumers you get to them the right way with the right product because when you go to grocery stores, when you pitch this to grocery stores now, you want to show a level of sales. So you can start leveraging when it comes to wholesaling because they're going to want to see a profit margin. They might want to skew the profit margin close to what they would or how they would mark this up. But if you come in with some clout, I have customers. You get this in the store, you brand it, you will get the customer. 
Beautiful. So leveraging the the B2C to get those B2B customers. Um, or the B2B because employees don't work all the time when it comes to B2B. So on their off time, if they recognize the brand outside in the store, they're more likely to get it if it's on the weekend. Wonderful. Yeah. So the, the last question, actually, it's kind of a two-parted question I have, and um, feel free if anyone wants to ask after. Um, so we have some, some students on the line want to um, kind of go back to your time at, at Sac State. And, you know, if you, were an entre- if you were thinking entrepreneurially at that time, what would be some recommendations you would have to, to them getting started? And then I also want to end with, um, is there anything this community do- can do to support uh, Easy Vibe? Hmm. On your free time at Sac State, if you got free time, you will need to talk to somebody who has a creative thinking. I'm gonna let you know. Um, Chris, I met Chris at CRC. It's like when I got off of active duty. So like 2010, we're in economics class. And it's a tough class because that professor just newly got his PhD. So he told us in the beginning he's not going to teach this at a community college level. He's going to teach it more to the PhD level. Boy, it, it was intense. I, we learned a lot. But when it came to answering a question that none of us really could get the answer to, and then he came up with a different way to get the answer, I looked over. I said, I got to talk to this guy after class because – I always thought I was an outside the box thinker. I said, no, no, he was far out the box and I need that kind of way outside thinking. So ever since then, that guy has been around. He's around till this day because I still bounce ideas off of him. So you just got to find like-minded people while you're at Sac State. Love that. Well, I know, I know a place where you can find them is the, the Carlson, Carlson Center. Center. So thanks, thanks for the tee up. There we go. Good yeah. teamwork. Um, no. So, um, and then, so I, so I got one, one more question that came in. Um, so let's ask this one. And then I want you to end with how can this community support you in an easy vibe. Um, but the question is, so assuming a whole foods buyout exit strategy, what's next after that? Depends how that negotiation goes down as far as royalties. Cause royalties are nice. Um, or is it going to be a full pledge buyout? Um, I haven't really figured that out yet because the way the business is structured, since e-commerce is such a big thing now, I can essentially buy out, get bought out by Whole Foods, continue to bring in royalties. But as my e- as my website base is, just like how Yahoo, Google, any other small big companies that's looking to be bought out, they have something that people are looking for, a customer list. So it, it's not necessarily something that's going to be targeted to those customers because all my customers, if I got 10, 15,000 employees, subscribers, when I start building out subscriptions for the Cobra, they're tied into my database because you have to put in your email address. So they're, they could be coffee drinkers, but to somebody who just wants to buy it out, they're just looking for numbers, not particularly what these consumers want. So that's another exit strategy. That's why I kind of lean more on technology as well. And I think everybody should lean more on technology because one exit strategy can turn into two. I love it. All righty. Well, and drawing us to a close, how can, how can we support you in, in Easy Vibe? Well, if everybody makes a purchase, if everybody makes a purchase, that's that's gonna do that's gonna do good. But the better thing, and you, you can't put a price tag on this, is going to be the review. Because before we get bombarded, before the world got bombarded by TV marketing, ads marketing, target audience, tar- target marketing throughout the audience, what they did back in the day was a word of mouth. Wonderful. And so how, um, obviously word of mouth, we can, we can be armed to do that. Where do we leave a review on uh, easy vibe? Is that best on your website? Or are you trying to drive traffic to Google, Instagram, where, where best suited our energy and giving a review? At your personal platform. 
personal platform. All righty. So um, with that, we'll draw it to a close. We're right at the, the six o'clock hour and let's give uh, Romain the virtual round of applause. I know it's never as fulfilling to uh, do it when right. it's hard to, to hear people, but um, thank you for spending the evening with us and, and hind- ending our global entrepreneurship week on such a high note. Um, and we just really appreciate you spending the, the evening with us. So thank you again. And thank you to the Veteran Success Center for partnering on this wonderful conversation. Oh, thank you, everybody. Thanks for having me. Wonderful. Well, without further ado, we'll call it to a close. Thank you, everyone, for an amazing Global Entrepreneurship Week. It's been, um, it's gone by surprisingly fast and been a, a, a lot of events, but been a great, a great amount of knowledge sharing and inspiration. Um, and I'm just looking forward to the future of the Sacramento region. So many amazing entrepreneurs, everything from cold brew to technology platforms to a variety of things. Um, so I think the Sacramento region is uh, on the pres- precipice for success. So um, thank you all. And we'll call it to a close and have a great weekend and rest of your evening. Great weekend, everybody. All righty. Hi, all. Thank you.